Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us. I don't know if this is on or if you really even need this. It's a pretty small space. This is an experiment for us. We, we haven't done a gathering in this space before since we've uh, renovated our, our President's Gallery, and, and we wanted to take a little time and invite retirees and friends back and uh, give you a little preview of what's coming here in our portrait, the UI Presidential Portrait Gallery. Uh, I'm John Culshaw, the University Librarian, and most of you I think we've met before. I would like to introduce a few members of my staff and colleagues who are here. So let me start with Paul Soderdahl, one of our Associate University Librarians who's here. Um, Mary Reddick, our Assistant University Librarian uh, for uh, Advancement. Margaret Gam is our Head of Special Collections. And Karen Shemansky is our Director of, of HR. And of course, our speaker today, David McCartney, who many of you know, our university archivist, who's going to, to really give you the story on what we've been doing uh, here in the gallery. Um, so, you know, when I, when I came to the libraries in 2013, uh, these president, presidential portraits were all here, uh, except uh, they, they weren't really taken care of, and we didn't have a complete set of presidential portraits. And uh, that kind of bothered me because at that point, we were, you know, Sally Mason was the president at that point, so she was the second woman to leave the university. But it basically looked like the university had been led for years just by older white guys, most of whom were already gone uh, by that time. Uh, also, the portraits hadn't really been cared for. Uh, they were, uh, I called them these sort of salad bar sneeze guard protectors. They were encased, <laughs> they were encased in plexiglass, and that plexiglass had sort of aged, and they just didn't really look very good. And uh, it was, you know, it just didn't really seem right. So I, I think I had a conversation with Sandy Boyd about this one day. Uh, I know I talked with others in the president's office, uh, talked with folks uh, in the Center for Advancement, and we managed. Uh, to put together a, a collaboration uh, that worked to both do restoration of the portraits that we have, uh, to clarify and really establish the ownership of those portraits. So these portraits are now all part of the university archives, which is where they should be, I think, part of the history of the university. And we are working to complete the set of portraits. And on October 17th, we will unveil uh, three new portraits in the gallery of Presidents Scorton, Coleman, and Mason. And uh, we have a commitment from the President's office to keep this up in the future. Uh, so we'll look forward to, to continuing to build and uh, share the history of the university here in the main library. I hope we can also use this space as a gathering space every once in a while. It's a nice place to come, especially on a hot afternoon. Also, it's not too bad out there today, but uh, it's a good place to gather, and uh, we're just really glad to be partnering with the Foundation, with the Center for Advancement, and the President's Office on this project. So, with that, I'd like to turn this over to David McCartney, who's going to tell us a little bit about uh, the, the history of the of our presidents, a little bit about our project, and uh, I know he'll be willing to take questions too. So, again, welcome. We're glad you're here, and over to David. Thank you very much, John. And also thank you to Mary Credig of the Center for Advancement for this opportunity for me to speak with you this afternoon. When I was first contacted about this program, I was very excited to hear about the opportunity to, to show for you the progress that the libraries in partnership with the President's Office and the Center for Advancement have made in developing this space on the fifth floor. But I have to caution you, I think this may be a consumer warning label, that I am not going to devote the next 10 minutes or so talking about the past 20 presidents of the University of Iowa. I think to do so and to give each administration an equal opportunity of review would mean that I would have about 28 seconds to discuss each individual. So rather than do that, what I thought I might do instead for a few minutes is talk about the tone of leadership that these portraits represent and the diversity of intellectual life 
that the university embodied at the leadership level. And I thought I might begin with a statement from 1858. The university had been chartered for a little over a decade at that point, but it had barely opened its doors for classes uh, just three years before. There was a long period of time between 1847 when the university was established by the Iowa General Assembly and the first classes that opened in May of 1855. Why did it take so long for the university to begin to gain some traction? In large measure, as we know today, the, the, the answer is money, or the lack thereof. Iowa was a young state. The University of Iowa was the second act by the Iowa General Assembly. And we were in early statehood, not a very wealthy state. It was a time when the university's board of trustees, as they were known at the time, was in a position to have to uh, raise adequate funds in order to establish the university. I like to think of us as one of the original land-grant universities, land-grant being lowercase l, lowercase g. <coughs> this was several years before the Moral Land Grant with, uh, Act was established by the U.S. Congress, which made possible such vocational institutions as Iowa State College of Agriculture and Mechanic Arts, as we know today, Iowa State University. Those schools certainly were land-grant, but so was the University of Iowa. And there was great difficulty in those first years in raising funds from those land sales. And the early leadership of the university was acutely aware of this. But in 1858, about a dozen years after the founding of the university, there was optimism. And you wouldn't expect it because just three months before the Board of Trustees issued its first report, there was an urgent need to suspend the operations of the university. Again, owing to a lack of funds. In March or April of 1858, the university closed for about two years. But in July of that year, the Board of Trustees issued a statement, perhaps to uh, instill confidence in themselves, because they certainly needed it at that point. And the statement is repeated over here at the introductory panel to the exhibit. And I invite you to read that and absorb it for the joyous optimism that that statement embodied at the time. And I'll read it to you here. We regard it as no small honor to have been the first laborers, the first working faculty organized in an institution which we believe is is uh, determined to have no distant day to take a high and noble stand among similar institutions in our land. July 6, 1858, the State University of Iowa Board of Trustees. Uh, that took a lot of uh, confidence to, to issue a statement that was issued at a time when there was great uncertainty on the eve of the Civil War. Uh, the, the first president of the university at that time, Amos Dean, purportedly had not even set foot in Iowa. He remained in Albany and uh, New York State for his entire uh, uh, time uh, as Iowa's president. <laughs> I cannot vouch for the accuracy of that, but it's one of those urban legends that have, that, that, that have been handed down through generations. Uh, of university history. And of course, it raises the question of whether he was drawing salaries from two institutions at the same time, none of which I can confirm or, or uh, otherwise verify. But that statement that I just read to you is, I think, a great paradox of how the university was founded. That in spite of the, what must have been unbelievable financial hardship, there remained a core of optimism among the founding faculty here. So I'll note a few of the presidents. I won't go through all 20 of them, but I'll share uh, a couple of stories, some of which may even be true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as I said, Amos Dean, our first president, was said to have never set foot in Iowa during his term as president. 
I don't know how you administer an institution from over a thousand miles away without even the benefit of telegraph, uh, let alone uh, the internet. Silas Totten, his successor, was said to be a sympathizer of the Confederacy. And uh, to the point where his son was particularly outspoken about this and even prepared and presented his own personal rallying call at the corner of Clinton and Washington Streets downtown. This was not well received here in Iowa City, and it wasn't long after the, uh, one particular incident that the uh, uh, top event was asked to leave. Uh, and not only Iowa City, but Johnson County. <laughs> and while many of our early presidents were members of the clergy, our first president, Amos Dean, studied the law. Our presidents represent a wide range of disciplines, intellectual interests, and leadership styles. They were members of the clergy early on. I think four of our first five presidents were ordained ministers in, uh, representing a number of different uh, denominations uh, in the Protestant tradition. We have had biologists, law scholars, engineers, and I, I haven't done a tally, but I am struck by the fact that even though this is primarily an array of older white guys, they nonetheless represented a diverse array of intellectual curiosity. And it strikes me that the quotations that emanate from their inaugural addresses or addresses to graduating students at the time of commencement, that these values that are imbued in what they believe to be the need for higher education uh, can, can only be perpetuated through those different diverse perspectives. Amos Dean was a lawyer. Silas Totten was trained as an Episcopal minister. Other successors include Spencer, Black, and Thatcher. Uh, they were Methodist, Presbyterian, and Congregational, in that order, respectively. Uh, Josiah Pickard was a historian. Science, in the late 1800s, took a more prominent place in higher education. And the question that I would bring up in that context is, how can science and religion coexist? And in the university's leadership at that time, there was a very sincere belief uh, among particularly Thomas McBride after 1900 that indeed they could coexist. How, I personally don't know. Uh, but that's a question that each one of us can, uh, can address. John Bowman was a very controversial individual. When he was selected, he was the uh, first uh, native-born Iowan and also the first alumnus of the University of Iowa to become president. He was controversial in part because of his age, and there is correspondence in the university archives that suggests that there was a great deal of skepticism over whether, uh, I believe he was about 32 at the time, uh, whether he could assume such a, uh, such a role. His controversy followed him later when he left the University of Iowa for what became for the remainder of his life, a uh, uh, career as chancellor and president at the University of Pittsburgh. And to this day, if you visit that campus, you will know it's a rather prominent 42-story structure known as the Cathedral of Learning. And this was a, a monument that he endorsed uh, in the late 1920s uh, as a, a rather uh, uh, empirical monument to uh, intellectual inquiry. Walter Jessup was a lifelong educator and really, I believe, is considered the first president who regarded education as uh, an academic vocation as well as a uh, realm of inquiry in its own right. Eugene Gilmore was an attorney. Virgil Hancher studied the law. Howard Bowen 
wrote extensively on economic theory. And after leaving Iowa, became president of the Claremont Colleges in California and continued to publish prolifically on, uh, uh, on uh, economics. Sandy Boyd, of course, uh, was trained in the law and became uh, once beloved leader of this uh, institution. Also trained in the law was James Friedman, his immediate successor. But we see uh, not only the uh, diversity of these backgrounds, we, we see even in more recent times uh, uh, an entry into non-traditional fields of leadership uh, that not unless prepared them well for, uh, for their administrative roles as president of the university. Very soon, Coleman's background was in biochemistry. Davis Horton, uh, lifelong, uh, a longtime uh, member of the uh, College of Medicine faculty, and of course, Sally Mason, uh, a biologist. The diversity of their interests, I think, can also be reflected by their range of leadership styles. I wish I knew more about these individuals in terms of how they led. But I can say, at least anecdotally, we have some documentation of this in the form of oral history interviews. And one of my favorite references to this comes up uh, with regard to how Sandy Boyd led and delegated responsibilities to uh, individuals who reported to him. We have an interview in the archives, I think, with Robert Engel, if any of you might remember Bob. Bob was Sandy's first primary assistant. Bob came from the College of Education. And I think Sandy saw in Bob somebody who had the capacity to work with different individuals under different and sometimes very trying circumstances. And I believe it was Bob who said in his interview that Sandy liked to use the vacuum approach to filling a need within the university's administration or elsewhere. But what, what do you mean by vacuum approach? And, 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 and Sandy meant that by taking somebody to fill that vacuum that was recognized, that one individual could have the autonomy to do what they feel would be appropriate in order to make that unit or department or college work. <coughs> and as Bob put it in the interview, it drove some of us crazy because we didn't have a direction. We weren't given the guidance that we felt that we needed. But the rest of us had a ball. <laughs> uh, the gallery that John mentioned is a work in progress. This is a gallery that has evolved over time. And in, in a way, I think it has its own odyssey to tell. And I've been attempting to piece together the history of it. Uh, I can say, at least in general, that bits and pieces of this gallery have been displayed at various locations around campus. For a time, it was centered at the Iowa Memorial Union. Uh, the President's home on Church Street was another venue for a period of time for at least, I believe, six of the portraits, not the entire collection. And not long after the Museum of Art, now the Stanley Museum of Art, opened in 1969, that was the home for the portraits for uh, a good number of years. And it was only recently that the libraries and the Stanley Museum of Art had come to a formal agreement which articulates that now the libraries will title and physical custody of all these portraits. If you haven't already, I encourage you to pick up a copy of this booklet. It includes biographies of each of the uh, past 20 presidents of the university. And there is also information about our online gallery which we launched recently, including the URL, so we can have a chance to uh, visit that on our computer. I would like to note that the preparation of the gallery was made possible not only uh, with the support of the Office of the President and the Center for Advancement, but uh, within the libraries, I would like to thank Nancy Kratt and Giselle Simone of our outstanding preservation and conservation area for bringing these portraits back to life. And I would also like to thank Kalia Strong of our public information area for bringing these exhibits even further into life with additional interpretation and 
more images that we will be uh, uh, introducing over the next few months. What you're seeing today is a portion of what you'll see in October when we have a completed uh, gallery available for you to view. It's still a work in progress, but we're very excited to add three additional portraits. Uh, the the uh, process for that I thought was very interesting, and I didn't know until John uh, enlightened me a bit earlier today about the uh, 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 portrait of David Sporton who very specifically wanted an Iowa artist to prepare the image. And so in that uh, regard, let's see, uh, the artist is Rose Branson from Opokna. And the story goes that once the, the portrait had been completed for shipment, uh, this is very Iowan. It was delivered in a van. <laughs> uh, John, fill me in on the details if you could. It was wrapped in it was, it was wrapped in plastic just one day after she finished painting. So our conservator was not too pleased about that. <laughs> we, we were a bit nervous. <laughs> but all worked out very, mm -hmm. very well. I hope that uh, when you have a chance to review the exhibit today, please take a look at some of the quotations that we've selected from a number of our past presidents as well. I'll close with a favorite that I refer to, and I have a copy of this in my office, uh, and I refer to it from time to time for inspiration, because we all have those days. I think you know what I mean. Sandy Boyd became president of the University of Iowa in 1969. Uh, he was 42 years old. Uh, and for those of you who are familiar with the 20th century history of the university, you know that 1969 was a particularly rambunctious time here on campus, uh, politically and, and uh, in other respects as well. And Sandy stepped into a situation that was quite uh, challenging. In fact, Howard Bowen, his predecessor, had resigned under some, uh, to, to some extent, under a degree of personal pressure because he felt that the, the environment here was simply untenable to, uh, to mind. And this was a situation or an environment that Sandy stepped into in 1969. And he joined the ranks of Robin Fleming at the University of Michigan, uh, administrators at other campuses that were facing considerable tension and strife, Columbia University, uh, the University of Wisconsin at Madison, uh, the, and of course, uh, the University of California at Berkeley. The University of Iowa was no exception to this. It was a very, very tense time, and Sandy took office without delivering an inaugural address. He got right to work. There was no inauguration ceremony for him. However, he did have an initial address to the faculty that he delivered in early September of 1969. And it was an admonition uh, more than anything else. And this is the quotation I keep in my office. And it's also up here. The challenge before us is no greater than that before our academic predecessors. We should welcome the challenge and have confidence in our ability to meet it. With that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. John can help with uh, background, further background about the development of the gallery. Uh, if I don't have the answers, I'll, uh, uh, I'll look it up. <laughs> because that's what librarians do, right? <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs> David, I'm curious about what you know, or maybe what John knows, or anybody else knows, about the roles of the presidents in the city of Iowa City. Uh, and one thing, one particular question I have is where do they live? Uh, I know that Gilmore lived in what we're currently calling the same St. Gilmore House mm -hmm. on, uh, on Market Street. Mm -hmm. But I don't know where the others lived. And I don't know which churches they went to. I mean, several Presbyterian members and so on. I don't know where they went. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know whether they tried to play influential roles within Iowa City as such. Do you? It's a wonderful question, and no, I don't. <laughs> um, no, I, I don't 
mean to be flippant about it. it it's, it's a very complex question because each president brings their own uh, their own degree of involvement within the community. Um, if I may back up just a bit before I get to the gist of the role of the presidents and suggest that the University of Iowa has always been so deeply interwoven into the community of Iowa City physically. Uh, the university has always been, from, from, from the very beginnings in 1855, has been uh, such an integral part of the city that nobody really quite knew where the boundaries were uh, between town and town. And, uh, and that's not just metaphorical, that's literal. Uh, and there have, over the years, the tensions between town and gout over expansion, which is why the West Campus became such an escape valve for growth after about 1924. Um, but to your question about presidents and their uh, uh, religious and, and social lines in the larger Iowa City community, I think you can find evidence of that in their papers. Do have a full index, fully indexed a set of papers spanning 1916 to 1976, older just up through about halfway through the Sandy Boyd era. And those papers include correspondence with local residents, and there may also in our department uh, we may have records of uh, just recently we acquired the records of the now closed First Baptist Church, which uh, was located on uh, Clinton Street. Uh, and I, in, in taking in those papers, I noticed there were membership roles that included university faculty and perhaps uh, former presidents. I don't know really if I can adequately answer your question in terms of, you know, did, did uh, Virgil Hampshire and his wife Susan attend a particular church? Did they have, uh, you know, a, a, a close relationship with, with the City. I think by definition, all presidents here did, uh, just by virtue of the fact that the university, I think more than most communities, has been so deeply intertwined with its surrounding community. By contrast, uh, Iowa State University developed very differently geographically, as I'm sure you know. Even today, if you look at a map of the Ames, you can see us, you, you get a sense that there was a great deal of intentional separation between town and gown. And indeed, uh, the Iowa Agricultural College, or Enlau Farm, as it was originally known, was intentionally founded five miles outside of Ames in order to discourage uh, liquor consumption by students, <laughs> among other reasons. But the the fact that Iowa State developed so independently of Ames, at least in its early decades, I think stands in sharp contrast to. Uh, the University of Iowa's development. It's a fascinating question, and I don't think I answered it at all. <laughs> but I think by, just by definition of the way that the city is laid out and the way the campus has developed, there, there have to be very, very intimate relationships between the two. Thanks. Yes? David, I believe in Hancher Auditorium there is a portrait of Hancher, mm -hmm. Virgil Hancher. Is that similar, or is that a copy? Or? I are there two of them? Don't what? recall. There, are, I'm sure there are other, uh, other copies or other, uh, other works. Uh, does it depict him in, uh, in vestments as well, or? Uh, I think it does. It's possible <coughs> that uh, that it had been reproduced for yeah. the auditorium, and I don't know if that had been saved from the original Hancher no. auditorium no. uh, dedicated in 1972. Yeah. Uh, the next time I'm over there, I'm going to. Yeah. Across from the cook shop. I can okay. give you one example yes, of Mary. university presidents that working with the city. Um, more recently with Mary Sue Coleman, the the what's known as the Armageddon Bridge that crosses the two mm -hmm. biology buildings. Mm -hmm. Yes. That goes over city street. <laughs> and it took some negotiation <laughs> I could imagine. to get that done. <laughs> I mean, there was a lot of When we moved here in 2000, I, I began my position here in uh, January of 2001. People were still talking about the, the 
Bridge. Blue Bridge. Yes. Capital T, capital B. Yes. Yeah. And um, you love it or you hate it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, but I, I can imagine that that's, that's an excellent example of how the city and the university sometimes yeah, yeah, needs to go. It was a really obvious example, except that I think very few people mm -hmm. got understood enough understood that this is good. Going over to the city on the space. <clears throat> Anybody else? You or that book? Yes, I'm sorry. Okay. You mentioned that uh, Bob uh, Engel. Engel, Bob Engel, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bob was also a minister. He came to yes. the city. In a dark room. From what I understand. <laughs> Bob, Bob and uh, my spouse James and I were uh, at that of course is why I think we just him terribly. Uh, but he really was such a uh, tremendous institutional memory source for us after we moved here. And I turned to Bob more than once not long after arriving here to ask questions about the about the recent relatively recent history of, of the university and its relationships with other with other entities. Uh, what I, I didn't get into at all the relationships between our leadership and the Board of Regents or with the Iowa General Assembly. And there were many times when Bob was a part of that guiding force for Sandy to work very effectively, which was what could have been a great hospital and was indeed a hostile legislature at that time. Um, on a personal note, my father was serving in the Iowa legislature during Sandy's first uh, three years as president of the university. So Sandy and my father became good friends. I, I think you might say that they were frenemies in a sense. <laughs> my, 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 my father was a Republican who nonetheless Recognize the value of public education and uh, not only K through 12 state support, but also at the region institutional level. And that was also a time when the area community college network was being rapidly expanded. Bob Engel himself, having a background as a professor in the College of Education, recognized the need to build these types of positive relationships with Iowa lawmakers from the perspective of someone who himself has been a teacher as well as a minister. And I think Sandy recognized that in Bob as a very, uh, really, uh, uh, not only as a treasured friend, but truly as somebody who could, um, could help him strategically in making some difficult decisions and attempting to build bridges where perhaps none could have been built before. We were recognizing library staff earlier, and I want to give special recognition to our newest member of the Department of Special Collections. Join me in welcoming Diane Pedro Hello. So, yeah. Thank you. Diane is continuing in the very long and proud tradition of our book and book arts uh, curation in the Department of Special Collections, and she comes to us from the New York Public Library, mm -hmm. and we are delighted to have her with. It's your second day. I hope we haven't oh. done it. <laughs> you haven't exited screaming yet. That's, that's good. My office is right next door to Diane's, and so I'll be the first to know of that. <laughs> <laughs> Margaret, you might be the second to know. Turn so her up the other way. Right. Are there any other questions? Well, please enjoy the exhibit. Don't forget to grab a copy of this. If we run out, uh, I'm sure we can. Thank you, David. Um, and if you haven't received uh, a copy of the newest findings, there are a few here on the table. I know that most of you probably already received one at home within the last couple of weeks. And I do want to remind you to mark your calendar so it's October 17th um, in the afternoon. I, I don't want to give an exact time yet, uh, but we will have the unveiling of the new portraits of Presidents Gordon, Coleman, and Mason. Uh, all of the presidents will be with us. 
uh, for that unveiling. So it should be a really uh, special day uh, for us to be able to show those new portraits, to have all of our living past presidents here with us, including Sandy, of course. Um, so uh, again, thank you so much for being here today. We appreciate your support, and it's been fun to kind of get ready for the bigger celebration this fall. So please take some time in the gallery here, and on your way out, if you haven't seen our Bicentennial Whitman uh, exhibit in the gallery, the main library gallery downstairs, make sure you pop in and see that too, because that exhibit will be coming down over the weekend. Uh, so, so the, because we're getting ready for the next one, I think we're trying to do three exhibits a year in there, we need a little time in between. So uh, uh, Stephanie Blaylock did an outstanding job curating that, so uh, please take a look, and thanks again, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.